Good afternoon, everyone, and happy Halloween. I almost wore my mask, but uh, decided you, I would spare you that. I'm Gretchen Crosby Sims, the Executive Director of the Institute of Politics. We are so pleased to welcome renowned historian and IOP board member Doris Kearns Goodwin to campus today for a discussion of her new book, Leadership in Turbulent Times. Copies are for sale outside, and she'll be doing a signing after the discussion. I want to mention a few upcoming events. Tomorrow, Caitlin Huey Burns of CBS News will be talking with IOP fellows and former congressmen Tom Davis and Steve Israel to give a preview of the midterm elections. On November 12th, we'll be unpacking the results of those elections with <laughs> Senator Shelley Moore Capito of West Virginia. You can find out more about these and other upcoming events at our website at politics.uchicago.edu. A quick word about voting. Um, these elections are coming up in just six days, and we at the IOP believe that voting is the most fundamental responsibility and privilege that we all have in a democracy. This fall, a group of students have launched a nonpartisan push to boost turnout on campus. So, if you would like to make... Um, That's our voting music. <laughs> If you would like to find a nearby polling place, check out their website at ushivotes.com. Um, the nearest voting uh, polling place for the next, for today, tomorrow, and Friday is right here on campus at Reynolds Club. Some of us voted early this morning. Um, please go to ushivotes.com or go over to Reynolds Club from 10 to 5 today, tomorrow, or Friday. Audience questions. We will open up the floor to take questions from the audience just after the conversation, so please make a note of any questions you have. Um, and bring it to the mic with you. The mics are going to be in the, in the aisle. Okay. Um, as usual, first, first three questions should be from students. We remind you that a question ends in a question mark. <laughs> <laughs> Always gets a laugh, <laughs> even with our regulars. Um, please make sure that your phones are on silent, all of us. And um, here to formally introduce our speaker is Michelle Shim. Michelle is a third year from Atlanta, Georgia, studying economics and English. She is currently the career development chair on the IOP's student advisory board. Please join me in welcoming Michelle to the podium. Thank you, Gretchen. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. Today, I am honored to welcome world-renowned presidential historian, Pulitzer Prize-winning author, and member of the Institute's Board of Advisors, Doris Kearns Goodwin. She returns to campus for a deep dive into her newest and seventh book, Leadership in Turbulent Times. As midterms rapidly approach, her book takes us back to reanalyze the lives of four presidents, Abraham Lincoln, Theodore Roosevelt, FDR, and Lyndon Johnson, in a way that couldn't be more timely. Her new book is a culmination of her five-decade career of studying American presidents, and it illuminates a complex human story to each of them, exploring their early development and growth, exercise of leadership, and enduring legacies that we see today. Perhaps most importantly, she delivers a subtle, multifaceted perspective of how they interacted with their times, bringing us back to our core question, does the man make the times, or the times make the man? And Doris Goodwin has been thinking about these questions from when she was a 24-year-old graduate student at Harvard, selected to join the White House Fellows, one of America's most prestigious programs in leadership and public service. She worked with LBJ through the Vietnam War and later assisted him in the writing of his memoirs. Her honors and awards are too numerous, but to name a few, her works have won the Andrew Carnegie, Carnegie Medal for Excellence, the Lincoln Prize, and the Pulitzer Prize in History. And she was also the first woman to enter the Boston Red Sox locker room. And as a, as a devoted fan, you must have been quite happy this past Sunday. Uh, moderating today's conversation will be David Axelrod, former senior advisor to, the pre to President Obama and director here at the Institute of Politics. Please, welcome, please join me in welcoming them. Thank you, Michelle. Yes, Doris, before we begin, congratulations on another title. I know how important this is to you, and I share your passion for baseball. Well, it was kind of an odd experience because my first love was the Brooklyn Dodgers, um, but then they were ripped away from us by Walter O'Malley. So I just, over the years, felt nothing than resentment. And then somehow when this series came up, 
I began to think of the people in Los Angeles. Maybe I'm becoming Lincoln-esque, and I was just hoping at least there'd be a seven-game series that would go to the last inning, and then the Red Sox would finally win. <laughs> but at least the people in, in Los Angeles would know what we now know four times. I don't think we've absorbed yet as people in Boston that we've won the World Series four times in the 21st century. It's our century. But I know you guys won the Chicago Cubs here. And when we won in 04, many of us were hoping that you'd win in 05. Somehow we were twinned with you for so long. We did win in 05. I no. know. Oh, you did. <laughs> you should have won. Yes, I understand. Oh, yeah. oh, oh my God, of course you're right. <laughs> you don't stray into this, <laughs> this, in the, to this travel stuff here. It's, oh my God. Yeah. Now I'm like President Trump. <laughs> 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 I've exacerbated divisions instead of bringing them together. You did win in 05. Let anyway, me just Chicago say, is a good place. When you said baseball. that you were hoping for the poor people in Los Angeles that the thing would go seven games, you're not like President Trump. Okay? <laughs> That's true. So, anyway. Hey, so um, <laughs> your, your, your books, uh, all of them really classics and incredible, um, were, are works of many years, each of them. And so where I want to start is how, how did you choose those leaders who are joined together in this book on leadership? What drew you to them in the first place? Well, I think what drew me into wanting to write this book on leadership is that I, I had studied my guys for a long period of time, and I do call them my guys, and I don't mean to be not deferential, but I've lived with them so long. It took me longer to write about the Civil War, then it took the Civil War to be fought, <laughs> twice as long as World War II to write about No Ordinary Time. And so you feel like you're going to bed with them and sleeping with them every, not sleeping with them, but thinking about <laughs> them in the morning and waking up with them at night. And so these were the four I knew the best, um, but I hadn't really asked them the questions that I wanted to ask in this, this book. And I also didn't want to leave one of them behind. It used to be, I was telling the students before, each time I did a new president, I'd have to leave the old guy behind. And I felt like I was leaving an old boyfriend behind and being traitorous. So this time I could keep them together. But ask about where did their ambition come from? Where did they, um, when did they first see themselves as a leader? When did they feel that politics was their vocation? More personal questions than I had asked and more directed questions in the big fat books. So it turned out to be a longer venture than I thought. It took five years. And I learned a lot more than I had known before. And yet, I was able to be with my guys once more. So it turned out um, to answer a lot of the questions when I was in graduate school. We used to think about those things, you know, those big questions. What creates success? When do you know you found your vocation? When do you know that, um, that you might be right for something? Or when do you feel somebody sees you as a leader? Though we used to think about Plato and Aristotle and, and drink and think of those things, and now I could do it again after 50 years of studying these characters. So speaking of your guys, they're all so different in, uh, in, in many ways. And, and you know, first of all, Lincoln and Johnson sort of grew up in withering poverty, the Roosevelts in incredible uh, opulence. Um, what is it that they had I, I want to talk about what uniquely defines each of them, but before that, what is it that is a common element of them that, that led them to be uh, the leaders that they were? Well, I think you know one of the common things, obviously, is that they learned early on that politics was a profession that fit their temperament, um, that could allow them to expand their understanding of other people's points of view, especially for the two Roosevelts that they came into that office probably not understanding very much about people who lived in tenements or people who grew up in the slums, and yet politics allowed them to expand what Teddy Roosevelt called their fellow feeling. So they all, which is really empathy, I'd say they all had in common empathy, the ability to understand other people's points of view. Some of it was inborn in Lincoln, maybe even in, in LBJ because of their circumstances, but others developed as the two Roosevelts did. They all had a, an ability a humility, which is to learn from mistakes, to grow in office. Um, I mean, Teddy Roosevelt, when he first came into the state legislature, he was so histrionic in the way he would yell and scream about his Democratic opponents. He would pound his desk, and he made headlines everywhere he went. But after a while, he couldn't get anything done. So he realized, he said, I've got a swelled head. I rose like a rocket, and I fell like a rocket. So, and the same was true of Lincoln, learning from that. Mistakes, he said, I'd like to believe I'm smarter today than I was yesterday because of the mistakes I made yesterday. They all had resilience that went through hard times. Um, they, they, 
experienced particularly harrowing times. I mean, Lincoln, when he was in his early 30s, went through a depression so deep that his um, friends took all knives and scissors and razors from his room. And it was in part because when he was growing, old, growing up, he had this huge ambition from the time he first entered public life that he was going to do something that would win the esteem of his fellow Americans. It was a, a desire to change the world, unlike the other three who enter politics for self and then eventually transform it to something larger. He had it from the start. But by the time he was in the state legislature, he felt like he hasn't reached anywhere near these huge ambitions. And he, there were some things that had happened that made him not keep his word. And he was so sad that he really, they worried that he would kill himself. And his best friend came to his side and said, Lincoln, you must rally or you will die. And he said, I know that. And I would just as soon die now. He's in his early 30s, but I haven't yet done anything to make any human being remember that I have lived. So that showed that he still had that wish and he had the resilience to get through a tough time. They all had that. I mean, Lincoln, when he first ran for office, actually, he said, I, I'm not sure I'm going to win. You don't know me very well, and I don't have any popular relations, and I'm familiar with disappointment. But then he said, but I promise you, if I lose, I'm going to come back. I'm going to try again. In fact, I think I'll try five or six times <laughs> until it's so humiliating, and then I won't try anymore, I promise. <laughs> but I mean, that showed perseverance. They had perseverance. Teddy Roosevelt went through a terrible situation where his my wife died in childbirth in the same day in the same house as his, as his mother who'd come to take care of her and got typhoid fever. So he goes home and finds both of them within that period of time gone. And then he goes to the Badlands because he has to get away from all this sadness. And in the Badlands, he becomes a Westerner. He becomes a cowboy. He would never have won the presidency, he said, had he not done that. So the resilience to go away from depression and find another way of dealing with it was his. Clearly with FDR, he had the resilience to get through the polio. I don't think he would have been the same president had he not had polio because suddenly he understood other people to whom fate had dealt an unkind hand. And he emerged from that experience much more warm-hearted than he had been before. I think the, the experience of going to the rehab center at Warm Springs, which he created, and he had his fellow polio patients there, and he knew that they had lost their sense of purpose and joy in life. So his role was not just to share his vulnerability with them, but when they're in the big giant pool exercising, he's doing more than simply um, teaching them how to get their muscles back. He's teaching them how to dance in, in wheelchairs. He's teaching them how to play water polo, tag, somehow be able to feel joy in life once again. And then once he becomes in the presidency and the paralysis of the country is there, that optimistic joy that he felt in life having resumed itself after this terrible tragedy comes to them. So I would say empathy and humility and resilience, we can talk about them separately, controlling emotions and impulses, communication, which we can go into separately, but there's a family resemblance even though each one is fit for the time in which they, they led. Uh, you know, just an aside on Lincoln, you mentioned his depression, and it makes me think about the fact that we know everything about presidents uh, these days and whether America would have accepted a president who had battled depression before. We know there was a period in our history 40-something years ago where a vice right. presidential candidate had to step down because he had had uh, electroshock therapy. Um, could Lincoln have survived this environment? Yeah, it's a terrible thought to imagine that if we knew that he had been near suicidal and people knew it at the time I and mean, they talked about it, he talked about it. Um, would that have made people feel he wouldn't be stable enough? And yet, I think the very fact that he had this melancholy, the very fact that he was sad much of the time, but was able to whistle off the sadness through humor, made him a much stronger figure. I mean, he said somehow a funny story was better for him than a drop of whiskey. And he was always able, in the worst of times, I think, to quell anxiety by finding irony or humor in the situation. I think that's the human kind, right? Um, there, there was a moment when they were making the movie Lincoln, and I wanted to make sure that Daniel Day-Lewis and Steven Spielberg put my favorite Lincoln story in, which just shows how odd his stories were, but they make you laugh, and when you laugh somehow when something's sad, something happens in the group. The story had to do with the Revolutionary War hero, Ethan Allen, and as Lincoln told the story, he went to England right after the war. He loved telling the story. And the British were still upset about losing the war, so they decided they'd put a huge picture of General George Washington in the only outhouse where he'd have to encounter it sooner or later. They figured he'd be very upset about the indignity of George Washington placed in an outhouse, 
But he came out of the outhouse not upset at all. And they said, well, didn't you see George Washington there? Oh, yes, he said. I think it was the perfectly appropriate place for him. What do you mean, they said? Well, he said, there's nothing to make an Englishman shit faster than the sight of General George Washington. And he had hundreds of these stories, hundreds of these stories. So you can imagine if you're in the middle of a tough cabinet meeting. So he had a technique for dealing with his depression, probably better than a psychiatrist might have helped him. He knew that it, being able to laugh at himself is a moment when somebody yells at him, Lincoln, you're two-faced. And he said, if I had two faces, do you think I'd be wearing this face? That's the way, that's the way you handle sadness. Yes, I've used that line myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I would like to think that, that if we knew that he was able to, in fact, by the time the Civil War came, he was the one who sustained the spirits of everybody else around him because he was so certain that eventually this war would be won. I mean, it is extraordinary reading your book. And I, I, I had the privilege of, of visiting your study in Concord, and there's an entire wall of Lincoln uh, books. But it is in, in, incredible uh, to think of the pressures that he withstood uh, during that period to lead the country uh, through the war. What, what, uh, so we've talked about the common elements of, of them. What are the unique elements of each of them that differentiated uh, them from each other but still contributed to uh, their leadership quality? Well, obviously, if, if we, we answer that question of whether are there qualities inborn or developed, and most of them are developed, Lincoln's gift for language was, was extraordinary. And he gave the struggle of the Civil War a meaning that with his language in the Gettysburg Address or the second inaugural, when he talks about reconciliation, even as the war is about to be won, and is able to put it in that beautiful language, you know, that um, both sides read the same Bible, both pray to the same God, neither his prayers were fully answered. And then, of course, with malice toward none and charity for all, let us bind up the nation's wounds. That's a time when words really matter, and, and they still matter right now. I mean, words can inspire, words can heal. And I worry about words in our, in our toxic environment right now, but that gift for language he had. Teddy Roosevelt had a fiery spirit that I don't think they could have even interchanged with one another, much less that they had unique qualities. He had that fighting spirit. So when he comes into the Industrial Revolution, when the economy is shaken up much as, as our economy is today, and there's a gap between the rich and the poor, there's immigrants, working class feels cut off from the capitalist era, and he has the fighting spirit for fairness. And he, he was able to articulate it in very short, pithy ways, the square deal for the rich and the poor, the capitalist and the wage worker. And he was fighting on the side of both sides, really, and saying that the people need to have some sort of healing of the division. So he had that right fighting spirit at a time that needed it. FDR, even though he didn't have the same gift for the words of Lincoln, he had that extraordinary voice that was able to be intimate to people so that when he had the technique of the radio around, he was able to make people feel that he was talking to them individually. He could hone in. If, if he were here now, he would be able to think of what each one of you represented, maybe a shop girl or a construction worker or a college student. And when he was on that radio, he pictured that person so that each person sitting in their living room or kitchen felt that they were being talked to directly. Saul Bellow, the novelist here in Chicago, said you could walk through the streets in Chicago um, and you could watch him sitting, in, watch people sitting in their living rooms and their kitchens, looking at their radios, hear his voice. You could keep walking and not miss a word of what he was saying. Eight out of ten radios are listening. And then there's a story of a construction worker who said, um, his partner said, why are you going home early? He said, because my president's coming to speak to me in my living room. It's only right that I be there to greet him when he comes. So there was a sense of that was a unique quality I think he had to create a sense of intimacy. Probably no president had created that sense of intimacy with the citizens, so much so that when he died, people felt they'd lost their friend. There was one person who said, isn't it amazing that one person's died and 130 million people feel lonely? And that was so important in that period, both of the Depression and World War II, that they felt they were connected to their leader. And I would say LBJ uniquely possessed the ability to deal with the Congress. Um, nobody knew the Congress better than he. It was his home. If he'd only had that same leadership strengths in Vietnam, the whole history of his presidency in our country would have been different. But on domestic politics, he knew what each senator wanted. I mean, he could call them up in the morning. He'd call them at lunch. He'd call them at dinner. He'd call a senator at 2 a.m. and say, um, I hope I didn't wake you up. No, no, I was just looking here at the <laughs> ceiling, hoping my president would call. <laughs> and then if the senator wasn't there, he'd talk to the wife. If the wife wasn't there, he'd talk to the kid. 
and he understood the importance of bringing, for example, on civil rights. I'm not sure that John F. Kennedy could have gotten that civil rights bill through the Congress and through the Senate, because the Senate was gonna mount, he knew, a filibuster, the Democrats did. Splitting the Democratic Party in two, you needed two-thirds votes. He had to get Republicans, but only he could probably go to Everett Dirksen, another man of Illinois, and say to him, okay, what do you want, Everett? You know, and they sit over drinks. You want an ambassadorship? You want, a, you know, you want something in postmastership in Peoria? You want me to come to Springfield? Done. Do all these things. But then he knows that Dirksen wants something more than that. So he said, listen to me, Everett. If you come with me on this bill, school children 200 years from now will know only two names, Abraham Lincoln and Everett Dirksen. <laughs> How could Dirksen resist? So I think each one of them had those particular qualities that were suited for their time. Um, and I, I, I'm not sure they're, they're interchangeable. Um, indeed, if you had other presidents there and those same challenges, Buchanan wasn't able to meet the challenge that Lincoln met. He had the same problem that the war was on the horizon and the country was splitting apart. Hoover was there when the depression was already very deep and was unable temperamentally to deal with it. So it's, it's a really interesting question of the family resemblances and then the individual traits that make them fit for their time. Uh, and you uh, uh, address this. It was so th there are innate qualities because there is this: do the times make the leader, or do does the leader uh, appear in the times? You, you you're in the second category. Definitely, I think as I say, there are gifts. But you know, as Teddy Roosevelt said, there. I was talking to the students about this. There's two kinds of success in the world. One is when you do have that special talent. But mostly it's when you develop ordinary talents to an extraordinary degree through hard work. And all of them worked really hard. I mean, that's the one thing that we can take from this story. It's so, uh, so clear and so simple in some ways. But that's where success comes from. Not really unless you're a Shakespeare or a poet and you have a talent that no one else can emulate. So I think that's, that sustains them too. The one thing they were also different in, in some ways, was except there's a family resemblance between three of them and not the fourth, is the first three knew how to find time to think, to relax and replenish their energies. Um, it's really important, especially for us today, when there's a feeling that our lives are so busy, there's no way to get away from what we're doing, to just totally go away from the pressures. But clearly, our pressures aren't as bad as whatever there were during the Civil War, or the Depression, or, the, or, or, or World War II. And yet they, they found time to just channel their thoughts away, except for Lyndon Johnson, which I'll mention. Lincoln actually went to the theater 100 times during the Civil War. He said when the lights came down and a Shakespeare play came on, for a few precious hours he could forget the war that was raging, and that was absolutely essential to him. Teddy Roosevelt was able to exercise for two hours every day in the White House. He had had asthma as a child, so building his body was important. And he loved to either have a raucous game of tennis or a wrestling match or a boxing match. Or his favorite exercise was this incredible hike in, in the wooded cliffs of Rock Creek Park. He used to take visitors along with a rule that you couldn't go around any obstacle. So if you came to a rock, you had to climb it. If you came to a precipice, you had to go down. So there's stories of these poor people falling on the wayside as they're trying to follow him in the woods. But the best story was told by the um, French ambassador. He said he was so excited he came in his silk outfit that he was going to come and walk with the president in the Champs-Élysées, finds himself in the woods, he's hating every minute of it. Finally, they come to a stream, and um, he says, thank God, it's over. And then he sees, and says, judge of my horror, as I saw the president unbutton his clothes. And I heard him say, I heard him say, well, this is an obstacle, we can't go around it, so we, we might as well go through it, no sense getting wet. So I, too, for the honor of France, took off my apparel, However, I left on my lavender kid gloves. If we should meet ladies on the other side, it would be most embarrassing if I didn't have my gloves on. <laughs> so that's him. And then FDR, amazingly, during World War II, has a cocktail party every night. And the rule was you couldn't talk about the war. You could gossip about things. You could talk about movies, books you'd read, as long as the war didn't come up. And after a while, the cocktail party was so important to him that he wanted people who would be living in the White House to be ready for the cocktail hour. So the White House became the most exclusive residential hotel on that second floor. His foreign policy advisor, Harry Hopkins, came for dinner, didn't leave until the war came to an end, stayed over that night. His secretary, Missy Lahand, lived with the family. Lorena Hickok, a friend of Eleanor's, lived on that family floor with Eleanor. And then there was, obviously, Franklin and Eleanor. And Winston Churchill came and spent weeks at a time in a bedroom diagonally across from Roosevelt's. So when I was writing the book, I became obsessed when I was writing the original book with the idea of all of them in their bathrobes at night on the 
the, uh, there's like six bedroom suites up there, right, on that mm -hmm. second floor, and thinking what incredible conversations they must have had, and wishing that when I'd been up there with um, Lyndon Johnson when I was 24, I'd thought of asking, where did Churchill sleep? Where was Roosevelt? Where was Harry Hopkins? But I wasn't thinking in those terms then. And as David knows, Hillary Clinton was listening to that radio program, so she called me up at the radio station, invited me to a sleepover in the White House, where we could then <laughs> wander the corridor together and figure out where everyone had slept. So a few weeks later, she followed up with an invitation to a state dinner, after which between midnight and 2 a.m., the president, Mrs. Clinton, my husband, and I, with my map in hand, went through every room and figured out, yes, Chelsea Clinton is sleeping where Harry Hopkins was, <laughs> the Clintons are sleeping where FDR was, and we were given Winston Churchill's bedroom, which meant there was no way I could sleep that entire night. He was sitting there drinking his brandy and smoking his present cigar. But so they all found those ways of relaxing, except for Lyndon Johnson. Even when he went to a movie, he couldn't bear it because it was too dark and he couldn't talk. When he wanted to go to a dance, he'd be dancing with the wife of a congressman to be telling her what her husband should be doing. When he had a swimming pool at the ranch, and we would go presumably swimming in it when I was helping him on his memoirs, but it was filled with floating rafts, with floating telephones and floating memo pads so you could work in every moment in the pool. So he was unable to relax and replenish his energies, and it, it told, and it hurt. You. Um the thing that also links these presidents, as different as they are, uh, is uh, a belief in government as a tool for progress. Um, and I'm thinking about now Teddy Roosevelt and his reaction to the uh, kind of convulsive changes in the economy that were wrought by the industrial uh, uh, by the industrial revolution and the times in which we live today. And it seems to me one of the fundamental differences is that government as an institution has been degraded uh, as part of a political project for now 40 years. Right. Um, and the question is, as we, as we confront the challenges that the new economy has presented, is there enough uh, confidence in government as a, as a tool for progress to actually meet the challenges in the way that Teddy Roosevelt did. I think it's a really important question. I mean, for, for each of these men, I think, government was the representation of the collective will to solve problems that individuals and local and state governments could not solve. So that when Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation, he knows that he's doing something that is, is, is using a power of the presidency, um, but he knows that in, in a certain sense, that the people themselves, if he can persuade them and transform them, that this is the right thing to do to make the war not just about restoring the Union, but about emancipating the slaves, that it's up to him to educate them that this is a use of his power of government. Clearly, as you say with Teddy Roosevelt, government wasn't involved in any way in labor management struggles. Government was doing nothing about monopolies that were growing. And he thought that as the steward of the people, and the, he had the responsibility of the collective will of the people, to do something about monopolies that weren't playing by the fair rules of the game, to regulate the corruption that was in the railroads and some of the big industries, and, and that he was doing it as, government is the expression of the people. And obviously when FDR got in, um, he knew that local and state governments could no longer handle the problem of the depression, so he expanded the government enormously to provide jobs, to provide the CCC, the TVA, to regulate the banks, and, 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 and people believed in what he was doing. And again, when, when LBJ comes in, the federal government was essential. The state governments were not going to solve in the South the problem of desegregating civil rights. And you're right, something has happened to, I mean, the, the idea that government is a progressive force, the idea that it's the collective will of the people, somehow began to be diminished, I think, in the 1980s, um, when government became more of the enemy of the people rather than the servant of the people. And it's been diminished continually since then. And unless the people have faith, it's not just faith in government, this thing out there. It's faith in us as a, as a, a collective will that there are problems that only we acting on our own behalf against some of the special interests in the society can, can deal with. And unless that we can imagine that again, then, then it's hard to imagine that we're going to deal with some of these problems that this new industrial order have brought, the new economic order. It's going to need help from us. And so, but that's what's going to take leadership, that's what's going to take language, that's what's going to take the people getting into government. It's going to take, why do we have that problem? Um, and we can talk about it. Money and politics is still a big problem, so that special interests have an enormous sway. 
Um, the way congressional districts are drawn means that we've got people on the right and the left, not in the middle. But there are answers to these things. I mean, we can have nonpartisan commissions. There's four states that are doing it now. There's states that are worrying about trying to overturn Citizens United and starting a constitutional amendment. There's answers to these problems if we have the will. I mean, um, FDR said, problems created by man can be solved by man. And I think it's, that's what we've lost. It's part of your question. We've lost that willingness to believe that these things are not beyond our control. They may seem complicated, but there are answers to our problems today. So we can't talk about a leadership in turbulent times without talking about the leader in tur turbulent times that we have. Um, and you know, I listened to you speak about Lincoln and with uh, malice toward none and charity for all. Uh, and uh, Lincoln said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Um, it seems at time that the president, the current president, has the opposite view on these things and, uh, and has a, a political calculation that he wins when the country is divided. Um, and what is the, and, and clearly he is a charismatic and persuasive leader for those Americans who are devoted to him. What is the impact of that? Well, you know, I think most, most leaders, when they get into the White House, even if they've come from a particular support base, their first instinct would be to want to expand that base. Mm -hmm. And I'm still not completely sure what it is that has made President Trump um, not even try, in a certain sense, to move beyond the group of people that supported him during the election. I mean, you're right. He, he was able to make them feel that he was on their side. He understood the people who felt left behind just as were left behind by the Industrial Revolution. He understood the anger that they might have felt toward elites or toward immigrants. He even then was playing on anger more than on bringing them together to a solution. But the normal instinct would have been when you have an inauguration, you've just won this incredible triumph to use your inaugural statement to try and bring people together. And yet that inaugural statement was filled with you know, carnage of America and not really an attempt to do that. There have been certain moments, certainly in this last week, when at a crisis moment, that's when we need our leader to, for guidance. We need our leader to call us to heal the divisions. And he had two chances to do it. And if he had done it, if he, just imagine after the bombing um, plot was discovered. I mean, that was the most significant bombing plot or assassination plot, even though it wasn't, didn't work against the top leadership structure since Abraham Lincoln when John Wilkes Booth was trying to kill not only Abraham Lincoln but the Vice President and the Secretary of State. And, and here we have a, a President who didn't even reach out empathetically to talk to the families of the Clintons or the Obamas or the other people who were the potential victims. But more importantly, um, instead he tried to, to say we, we need to unify, but then even when he was giving that speech his aside came out, which said, see, I'm being good, aren't I? I'm being good. And then he went back the next day to say, not shouldering. He could have said, suppose he had said then, you know, there's a toxic rhetoric here. I, the line has to be drawn now. I'm going to shoulder it as well as everybody else. We have to soften this. It would have cruised him to victory, I think, even to victory. But there was some fear that the base wouldn't want to hear that. I don't understand where he is, or he couldn't think that way. And then he said, even after the bombing plot was exposed, you know, you know, we had momentum, the Republicans had momentum, and then this thing happened. Yeah, the thing was bad, but we have to get our momentum back. As if you said it, the bomb it, thing. The bomb thing, this bomb stuff was bad, almost as if somehow it was an interruption. And then again, he had another chance with the bombing of the Jewish synagogue, and, um, and, he, and he couldn't help himself still um, to, to again talk about unity, but then somehow to be back again on the campaign trail trying to change the subject to a caravan or to birthright citizenship so that we wouldn't be able to use that incident and try and understand why is this anti-Semitism on such a rise. That's what we need a leader for. So in those crisis moments, um, I'd like to believe that these other four would have recognized their first instinct is that they are president of all the people. Somehow that campaigning mode has never translated into the mode of being the president. And we all keep waiting. This is the moment when it's going to happen. And maybe he's not capable of having it happen. Maybe he's afraid he'll lose the base. The base is like his security blanket. And he's afraid if he doesn't express their angers that he might lose them and then he'll lose the election. Um, but the calculus makes no sense even because he could have broadened the base. Enough people were already feeling like after the Kavanaugh hearings, that I think the Democrats had lost the narrative. He had gotten the narrative back. And now I, I think he's lost it again, but we'll see what happens. 
Although even in regaining the momentum there, it was by pursuing a divisive exactly strategy. Right. L let me ask you about the relationship of these presidents to the news media, the <laughs> press. I, uh, I work for president. I, I would guess that there were times when every single president was outraged about something that they had read in a newspaper or seen on television. Um, but this president has made the press uh, a, a foil. First of all, how did they relate to the media? And, and how do you assess the way he is relating to the well, media? Well, I mean, just think about Teddy Roosevelt. I mean, he really made the muckraking press, the investigative press, his partner, because the, the, he knew that there was a conservative Republican majority in the Congress that wasn't going to regulate the railroads or wasn't going to regulate food and drug unless the people got exercised about the corruption that was out there. And so the investigative reporters would produce these 30,000 word articles in these magazines and people would read them. I mean, it was a different time and they would get upset. And then they would put pressure on the conservatives in the Congress so those bills got passed. So he knew without that partnership with the media, but he understood that he's gonna be criticized by the media. There's a wonderful moment when he wrote a, a memoir about the Spanish-American War and his experience in it as a soldier and a, and a captain. And he, it, and he made himself the center of every moment in that war, so much so that a journalist wrote a scathing review of his memoir saying he should have called it Alone in Cuba, as if he was the only one there. But instead of battling back, he writes a letter to the journalist. He said, and the whole country's laughing. This is a humorous journalist. He was very famous at the time. So he said, I regret to tell you that my wife and my intimate friends are absolutely delighted with your review of my book. So now you owe me one. I want to meet you. And so the two of them, the, the journalist was unsure about meeting with him. He was afraid he'd be caught up in, in Teddy's charisma, but he was still able to criticize him. Teddy accepted it. Of course he got mad at times, but that he understood the importance of that partnership. And then think of Franklin Roosevelt. He had two press conferences a week, and that meant that he had to spend a lot of time preparing for them. He understood that it, it was going to take a lot of his time, but he thought they were the channel to the American people and um, they were able to ask him questions. Some of them would be on background. It wouldn't be as possible today in the television world, but without the press, he couldn't have done what he did. And the idea that, the, you're right, they all get mad at them. In fact, when I did an exit interview with President Obama, and we were talking, not about the press particularly, but about anger that a president develops at all sorts of times. He said he was more, he swore more than he ever had during the presidency. And I talked to him about the fact that Lincoln, when he got mad at somebody, and often it would be somebody in the press, he would write an angry letter to that person and then put the letter aside, hoping he would cool down psychologically and never need to send it. And, and you see in his papers a raft of such letters with blistering language and underneath never sent and never signed. <laughs> so I was, was talking to that about with President Obama. I said, do you ever do that? He said, what do you mean? He said, I do it all the time. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I write these angry letters all the time. And I said, what do you do with them? He said, I crumple them up and throw them in the wastebasket. <laughs> what a better way to deal with your anger instead yeah. of just letting it come out. But yes. somehow again, tweets can be saved. You don't have to send them. You know? Right, exactly. In fact, yeah. that he should have hot tweets yeah. and then cold tweets. But actually, some... but it's it, it is it is true that uh, what the modern media age has facilitated is spontaneous reaction. Right. There is no moment of introspection. I don't know. Some people aren't capable of introspection, but there is no moment right. of introspection, and it is because, as you point out, words. Words are matter. Absolutely. Uh, and, and those a, words matter as well. It's a real problem. I mean, the, when, when Lincoln got into the presidency, he was so able to speak spontaneously in those, in those Stephen Douglas debates. He was able to quip back and forth extraordinarily. But once he got into the presidency, he realized that his words mattered. He almost never spoke spontaneously. Even when people would come to serenade a Union victory, and they used to come to the White House, he'd come out to the balcony, and they'd all be singing down there. He would simply thank the soldiers, thank the people for coming, join them in singing, because he said he wanted to make sure that every word was prepared before he said it. So again, it's that transition from a campaign mode, and, and they were so accustomed to those really tough statements against one another. The, the partisan divide was huge in the, in the 50s. Um, they would be 7,000 people coming to those debates with, with... The 1850s. The 1850s, yeah. yes, the 1850s, yeah. I'm back another 100 years. <laughs> again. And, and there'd be um, eight hours or six hours of debates, and they'd go after each other. 
And so uh, he had that talent, but he, he let that talent go away once he became president. And again, that's a symbol, I think, that the president has never left the campaigning mode. And, but why the, he loves the press, he needs the press. Having made them his enemy again is, is, I guess, because he needs to have something that will explain when something bad is happening. It's fake news. It's an alternative fact. And so he can make people feel that the thing he's done that everybody else is criticizing isn't real, that it's just something fake that these newspapers are ginning up. But it's a very dangerous thing. There's never been a president who's, who's made them the enemy the same way that this one has, I think. You probably know this as well as I or better. Well, you, you point out the paradox. He's made them the enemy, but also uh, they, are a, uh, they are a tool in his toolbox. I mean, he, right. he understands the modern media environment as well as anybody, and he knows how to use it uh, in ways that he thinks are to his uh, advantage. Uh, the microphone is up. Please line up if you have questions. My last question is, um, the, uh, there is so much uh, angst about where we are, and it is common to hear we've never been more divided. Uh, I'm not sure whether the American people are as divided as our politics is, but you hear that. Um, and it strikes me as uh, uh, counter to the history of our country. We've had, we fought a civil war here. Right, that seems right. pretty serious in terms of acrimony. Um, but talk a little bit about that and, um, and what might give you hope. Yeah, I really think it's important. I think this is where history can provide reassurance and perspective. It's important to remember that if you were alive now at, at the beginning of the 1860s and, and the country had actually split in two, can you imagine? I mean, there's another capital in the country, and as well as Washington, a civil war that's going to kill more than 600,000 people is about to begin. And you don't know how that's going to end. The country might have split for good. It might have been a, a never-ending war that was going on. That's certainly a harder situation than we have today. Lincoln even said if he'd ever known the anxieties he would undergo when he first got into office, he wouldn't have imagined that he could have gotten through them. And then, as I say, this, the, the Industrial Revolution was, was, was much more potentially um, div divisive even than this one is because the people in the working class felt that no one was looking after them and there was a talk of a coming revolution. There were bombs in the streets. There were nationwide strikes. And so in that period of time, people would feel maybe even more anxiety than we feel now and certainly the depression. If you are at the bank and you're trying to get your money out of the bank and the bank is collapsing and there's no money to be had and there's no jobs to be had and hunger is in the streets and you're not sure whether or not capitalism is going to last, World War II in those early years, um, before the, the Allies began to gain hold, it was possible that Hitler had controlled almost all of Western Europe. And even the civil rights struggle, it wasn't clear that those racial tensions could be healed in the somewhat as they were during the 1960s. So remembering that what two things happened at that time, one was we had the leader in place, and that's something we do not have right now, but we also had the citizens who were awakened to their responsibilities um, as Lincoln said, he wasn't the liberator. It was the anti-slavery movement that did it all. As I said, it was the progressive movement that did it for the, the other two and the civil rights movement. So the women's movement, the environmental movement, the gay rights movement, we have to remember that most of the social change that's taken place in our country has come from the citizens on the way up, not from the leadership on the way down. So it's up to us right now, and we have to just exercise that power of citizens more now than ever before. Not simply just voting, which is absolutely the first fundamental thing, as you said, but it has to be also getting more involved in politics like people were in the old days. Politics used to be the sporting event of the time, and we just have to make it part of our busy lives at, at the local level, at the state level, and at the federal level that this is our citizens' responsibility. We have to reform this political structure, which is very unhealthy, even before... President Trump, it was unhealthy. There's lots of changes that have to be made. And I think the lessons of history are, we've made them before, it's been much more difficult before, and we've gotten through it. And we've got to take solace in the fact that this country's backbone comes through at these moments of crises, and it just has to again right now. But it's up to us. Yes. Please. Hi, uh, my name's Jack Edlis. I'm a student at the Harris School of Public Policy. Um, first, I want to ask, it seems to me representatives and I guess leaders today don't often um, propose or fight for policies that begin unpopular with with people or they're more pandering to more basic emotions. Um, 
And I wonder, first of all, if you agree with that, or, or to polling data or something like that. First of all, if you agree with that, and second of all, um, whether there are examples of these men you've studied kind of bringing the people to their position and yeah, why think, you think it's changed if it has. No, I, I think, you know, to some extent, the public opinion polls that we have so clearly in people's minds to know which policies are already wanting the people versus, you know, and especially which policies your own interest groups care about. I think the problem is that because the politicians who come in are so indebted to the people who put them into office that sometimes they're not willing to change their, their policy stance knowing that, well, piss off is not the right word. That's what LBJ would use. Um, yeah. Seems apt. Yeah, it seems apt. Um, where it, what leadership is, is staking out a position and then hoping you can bring the people to it. If they haven't really gotten there, that's educating the people. Um, I mean, it, interestingly, when, um, when, when LBJ decided to make civil rights his first priority after JFK was assassinated, his advisor said, it's not going to work. It's probably going to get stuck in the Senate. You'll be a failed president when you go before the people in 11 months. And most importantly, you've only got a certain amount of currency to expend. And that's what politicians think. I only have a certain amount, and you have to decide what to spend it on. You can't spend it on this. And then he said, well, what the hell is the presidency for? So that's one of those moments when you decide, I'm going to take this chance. I'm going to risk something. He said, I'm going to put in all my poker chips on this thing and hope I can persuade the Congress and the country to come along. And it's that kind of leadership. I mean, I think President Obama did that. Um, yeah, and I would say on the Affordable Care Act, absolutely, that was a very absolutely. perilous pursuit, and he knew it going in. And we had those discussions. Right. So, uh, yes. Hi, my name is Akash Mehta. I'm a, a third year in the college. Um, I wanted to ask about what you were just saying about, about movements and how it's the movements that have done all the work and these thinkers are kind of the, the manifestations of, of movements. Um, and I wanted to ask where the project of biography fits, fits into that uh, understanding of, of history because there, there's a critique of, of the kind of project of maybe writing biographies but maybe especially of how they're read as, as fitting into the kind of great man theory of history where we need a savior uh, r rather than, than, than doing it through our own movement? That's a wonderful question. And I think what's been very encouraging about the way history is taught in these last few decades, as opposed to the way it was taught in the 19th century, even though I have ended up writing biographies of these white guys, <laughs> since that's who they are so far, I'd like to think that underlaying the biography is this understanding of the relationship of whatever the movements were at the time with the biographies. But I think it's, a, I think it's been a very healthy thing that in a lot of history courses now, the focus is on not just the leader at the top, but on the movements in the society. Because otherwise, there is that sense of unless we have the right leader and the great man, and that's never true. I mean, it's, it's always true this other way around. But it is true also that a leader channels whatever the movement's emotions are. And without the leadership on the top, sometimes the movements can't do what they would hopefully do. But I think that historiography has moved in that direction. So there's a lot more about women's movement. There's a lot more about gay rights movement. There's a lot more about social movements and about the people, as opposed to the old days when we'd just be studying those guys on the top. So um, I think it is a critique of biography. And as I say, I, I accept that critique, except I'm hoping that by creating these people alive and making people feel they're living in their time and catapulting the people back to that time, that there's enough in the story as well of what it was that the citizens were doing at the time that they were able to translate into words and into actions so that that balanced view of leadership comes out through a biography as a form. But somehow through individuals, I think sometimes uh, people can, un they can emotionally connect to a period better than when they're just reading a whole series of things. And so if you can bring the series in through the person, then maybe you get the person to understand what it was like to live in that time. Good question. Hello, I'm Isaac Wink. I'm a fourth year history major in the college. Um, and I'm very interested in your story of getting to go back to the White House um, and uh, map out the rooms during FDR's presidency. Um, because I think there's something almost magical about being able to inhabit these spaces um, and think about the stories that were going on there 50, 100, 150 years ago. Um, and I think in another interview, you talked about getting to go back to LBJ's ranch um, and sit in a closet he made you sit in when he was taking naps because he didn't want to be alone um, while you were working on this book. Um, so I'm just curious, when you get to go back and inhabit these spaces, 
what is it that you're feeling um, and what sort of impact do you think it's having on your writing or the way that you're thinking about these people? Oh, I think it has a huge impact. I think if I were to take children around and want them to know, you know the history, say, of the presidency, more important even than the museums to take them to is to take them, if you can, to the homes of the presidents. There's something, I don't know, maybe it's just a visceral sense when I go to FDR's home or I saw Eleanor, Eleanor's home so different from FDR's home. I mean, FDR's home was beautiful and you know, sort of like, a, like this with big library um, and beautiful mahogany floors and beautiful windows. And then Eleanor's home, which was a little bit away from there, she got her own home for after a while, was filled with chairs that none of them matched because she wanted fat or thin or a tall or a short person to be comfortable in the chair. And it just represented her. You could feel her presence in it as I could feel FDR and his mother's presence in their home, or going to Sagamore Hill and seeing Teddy's home. Or as you say, I went back to the ranch just a couple of years ago when All the Way, the movie about LBJ, was premiering in Austin. And it was the first time I'd actually gone in the ranch since um, I'd been there because it had become Lady Bird's home. And just to be able, as you suggested, I, there was a closet in his bedroom that he used to want me to sit in because he got very lonely when he took a nap and he was afraid that something might happen to him. I mean, the sad thing is when he actually died, he was alone in that bedroom and called for the Secret Service. And by the time they got there, his heart attack had killed him, the very thing he had feared. But maybe it's just because we know what it's like to walk around a house. We know what it's like to feel a family presence in a place. And there's a visceral connection to the past that creates itself from being there. I mean, the, the, the end story about the being in the White House and being in Churchill's bedroom was that um, it was my favorite story in World War II, too, which is that when Churchill came there right after Pearl Harbor, he and Roosevelt were set to sign a document that put the um, Associated Nations against the Axis power, but no one liked the word Associated Nations. So that morning, while Churchill's there, Roosevelt awakens with the whole new idea of calling them the United Nations against the Axis powers. He's so excited, had himself wheeled into Churchill's bedroom, our same bedroom, to tell him the news. But it so happened Churchill was just coming out of the bathtub and had nothing on. So the president said, I'm so sorry, I'll come back in a few moments. But Churchill, ever able to speak, put himself straight up and said, oh no, please stay. The prime minister of Great Britain has nothing to hide from the president of the United States. So that next morning, to go to your point, I couldn't wait to go in the bathtub. And then I truly felt, I am in the presence of the greatness of the past. But I think that's the, um, that's the hope of an historian somehow is by, if you can, go to the places where they actually lived and walked and talked. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens 200 years from now because historians will have access to watching us. They'll see how we walked. When, when we were working on the movie on, on Lincoln, the only reason we knew that Lincoln had a high voice was because someone wrote that he had a high voice. So when Daniel spoke in this high voice, people said, he was supposed to have a baritone voice, but there was evidence that he didn't, but not because we heard him. We only knew that he walked like a laborer coming home at the end of a hard day, that kind of loping walk, because that's the way somebody described it. So they'll see us walking, they'll hear us talking, but will they know us in the same way? They won't have letters, they, which are my favorite source as an historian. You're reading a letter that somebody has written, just like going to the house. I could picture myself over the shoulder reading this handwritten letter that Seward, who wrote a thousand letters to his wife during the Civil War, because she was in Auburn and he was in Washington, and he's talking about not just what Lincoln did that day, not what he did as Secretary of State, but there's a moon out there and the same moon and we're looking at it now. And then you have diaries that people kept in those days where again those intimate thoughts are created. We, what will we save? Maybe emails, um, Instagrams. I don't know whether the technology yeah. will save them or tweets. There's no way of understanding the emotions of these of these larger people without the explanatory stuff that the well, old... Well, you've got those smiley faces. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, or the down faces. Yeah, so emoji, so. emojis. <laughs> but you're right. The, the, real, the real hope of being able to bring history alive to people is to recreate the, the, the daily life, in a certain sense, of what they were. And you're not going to write it day by day. My favorite source when I went to the FDR library was there was an usher's diary that kept a daily record of when Eleanor and Franklin awakened, who they had for breakfast, not who they had for breakfast, who they had breakfast with, um, who they had lunch with. And then you could go to their memoirs and diaries and talk about it. So recreation is, is what you're hoping to do with history. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Alex Weissman. I'm a first year here. You've studied all of the leaders that you write about so deeply. Do you ever worry that the closeness you feel to them informs the way that you write about them? I think in a certain sense, yes. I mean, I've, I've chosen leaders at the very first 
that I would want to stay with for that long period of time. I couldn't write about Mussolini or Hitler. I just wouldn't want to live with them day by day. So there's already a bias in the fact that I've chosen leaders who, even though they're going to make mistakes, they're going to disappoint, are basically leaders that I respect. The hardest situation was LBJ. I mean, while it's true that all the other leaders made mistakes and you deal with them, hopefully you're not a judge of them, you're, you're telling what they did and letting the reader see this, this was a mistaken judgment, this was wrong. You're not biasing the actual writing, but there's a bias in choosing them in the first place. And obviously the Lyndon Johnson was the most difficult one because I knew him. But by the time I wrote that first book, there, the anti-war sentiment was still so strong in the country and in me that it's really tough on him. And I still feel tough on him, his epic failure of leadership. In fact, I included a coda in this book because the book is mostly about his extraordinary leadership in the domestic affairs. I mean, think of what he was able to do. Three great civil rights laws, fair housing, ending segregation, voting rights, Medicare, Medicaid, NPR, PBS, immigration reform, um, aid to education, lower education and higher education. It's the foundation of so much of our life today, and yet that same strength was completely undone in Vietnam, and I talked about that. So you have to be willing to accept that these people that you basically respect, you want to live with them, you've had a great time living with them, just like a friend or a parent or somebody is going to disappoint and going to do things that are, that are really against what the grain of the country is, and you have to deal with that honestly, even though um, it, 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 it's difficult to do that, and you may feel it even more as you're doing it. And then, of course, they're going to have to die, and, and that's hard when you get to that, too, when you've been living with them for so long, and each time I got to one of their deaths, I, I couldn't stand it. The only thing that, that helped me with Lincoln was I just didn't want to end with him dying, and luckily there was this great interview that Leo Tolstoy gave to a New York newspaper man at the turn of the 20th century that I could put at the end instead of Lincoln dying. He talked about having just gone to a remote area of the Caucasus where there are a group of wild barbarians who never left that part of Russia. They were so excited to have Tolstoy in their midst that they asked him to tell stories of the great men of history. So he said, I told them about Napoleon and Alexander the Great and Frederick the Great. Um, but before I finished, the chief of the barbarians stood up and he said, but wait, you haven't told us about the greatest ruler of them all. We want to hear about that man who spoke with the voice of thunder, who laughed like the sunrise, who came from that place called America that is so far from here that if a young man should travel there, he'd be an old man when he arrived. Tell us of that man. Tell us of Abraham Lincoln. Tolstoy was stunned to know Lincoln's name had reached that far. And then he was asked by the, so he said, I told him everything I could about Lincoln. Then the reporter said, OK, so what made Lincoln so great? Tolstoy said, well, he wasn't as great a general as Napoleon, perhaps not as great a statesman as Frederick the Great, but his greatness consisted in his character and the integrity of his being. And so then I thought, yes, I can end the book that way. He's not dead after all. He's being remembered. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, John Havlick, fourth year in the college. Um, at U Chicago, we're often taught about the wonders of diversity of thought and the wonder of all things that diversity brings. Um, and I think there was significant amount of diversity in Team of Rivals, as you talked about uh, in that book with Lincoln and his cabinet. Um, I think we haven't seen as much of that in recent years. Do you think that team of rivals was an anomaly? And do you think there's potential for it in the future? Well, it certainly takes the confidence of a leader to be willing to surround himself or herself someday with people who are going to question your assumptions and argue with you and have been opponents of you. Obviously, President Obama did it in putting Hillary Clinton in as Secretary of State. And he, re he was reading your book during that campaign. Yeah. I, I actually think it influenced his thinking. Well, he, you know, he, he, he was teasing me. He called me up during the campaign. He was behind Hillary at that point, though, way behind. But he just said, on my cell phone, I suddenly hear, hello, this is Barack Obama, and we need to talk. He said, I'm just reading Team of Rivals, and I want to talk about it. But he wasn't talking about putting Hillary in the cabinet then. He was simply amazed about Lincoln's emotional intelligence, how you could forget resentments, how you could forgive people in the past, and how you could be Lincoln as a good person. And then, of course, when he won the nomination, somebody asked him, a reporter said, would you really be willing to put into your inner cabinet uh, a chief rival, even if his or her spouse were an occasional pain in the butt, <laughs> obviously referring to Hillary? And he then quoted Lincoln at that time. He knew enough to you know, to know what Lincoln had said. And then the night before the inauguration, I was down there for NBC, and, and um, Vernon Jordan, there was a party there, and Hillary was there. And she came up to me and she's, you're responsible for my being Secretary of State. Not, not me, but Abraham Lincoln, that's for sure. But you know, even FDR, even though he didn't have quite as many strong-minded views, he had some strong-minded views in his cabinet, but he had Eleanor. 
as he said, Eleanor was a welcome thorn in his side. She could always question his assumptions and always argue with him. I mean, she sent so many memos to General Marshall in the War Department <laughs> that he had to assign a separate general whose only task was to deal with, with her <laughs> memos. She had a weekly press conference. Only female reporters could come all over the country. They had to hire their first female reporter. I mean, she could be the moral force. He could be the politician. And that was an extraordinary partnership. I think it's harder today. It's harder because once you cross party lines, like remember when John Huntsman took the ambassadorship to China, right, and was considered a traitor to the Republican cause. There's always been a Democrat or a Republican in the Secretary yeah. of Defense. That's always been Democrats were pretty ouchy when he came back and ran against the president, too. Yes, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So that's difficult, right? Yeah. And I think the media makes it difficult. If we had read what the people in Lincoln's cabinet were saying about each other in their diaries, because they didn't like each other as much as they didn't like him at times, it would be explosive. And now everything's leaking from the White House. So it's, it's a harder time to do it, but it's an even more important time to do it now than it was then. Thank you. Thank you. We've got one more question here. Hi, my name's um, Ben Ruffle. I'm an MBA student at Booth. Um, first, I just want to say it's a delight to hear from you both, so thank you for being here. Uh, I have uh, a deceptively simple question. You've obviously studied men um, from disparate socioeconomic backgrounds and, and different temperaments, but all seem kind of united, but with a fierce ambition. So my question for you is, well, where do you think ambition comes from? It is the most interesting and the most mysterious question. I mean, I think, you know, it's interesting. When I, when I again, when I interviewed President Obama, I read him Lincoln's statement at 23, saying, every man has his peculiar ambition. Mine is to be esteemed of by my fellow man. I said, does that ring true to you? And he said, no, it was different for me. And he said, probably different for most people. Maybe my ambition was much more common than that to start with. Uh, maybe it was to prove myself to my vanished father. Maybe it was to prove myself in a mixed race to the other people in the race, or maybe just to make my mark in the world. Um, but only later did the ambition get connected to politics and then to the greater good, to wanting to heal the divisions and things in the country. Um, so I think it comes from all of us in different ways. It could come from somebody like Lincoln who dreamed of another way of life beside the way of life he had through the books he'd read. He sort of started thinking, I can maybe be something bigger than I am. Sometimes it comes from people, I was talking to the students about this before in our shorter session, from people who've just enjoyed being the center of attention because they were the love of their family as Teddy Roosevelt was, or as Franklin Roosevelt, and they want to repeat that center of attention. Um, sometimes it can come from, from a tough situation that you want to undo and, and want to persevere, or sometimes it can come from just being lucky, and you move from one step to the other, and then people see you, and then you begin to think, I can take more responsibility, I can do it. Um, and I think we'd all have to ask ourselves, I'm not even sure I fully know the answer to myself, where did my ambition come from? I know that in some, to some extent my desire to be a storyteller came from my childhood, from both my father who taught me that mysterious art of keeping score while listening to baseball games so I could record the history of that Brooklyn Dodger game. And when he came home from work, I could feel like I'm keeping my father's attention by telling him this story that happened five hours ago. History is pretty special. Or also my, my mother had had rheumatic fever when she was young, so she had a a damaged heart, and I just wanted her to tell me stories of the days when she was younger, before her heart condition set in, so I could imagine her mind controlling her body, and the premature process of aging we were witnessing stopped in its tracks. So storytelling became a way for me to bring back, my mother died when I was um, only 15, my father died when I was in my 20s, so it was a way of bringing them back and keeping them alive. And then it became storytelling to bring these other people alive. So it was storytelling that I think was the source of my ambition. It could have ended up as a professor. It could have ended up as a writer. And, and that was just the trajectory of my life ended up being a writer. But I bet if we all asked ourselves, it, it was a, a question. If we had three hours here, I'd love to hear everything about what, where that ambition came from. So, but before I stop, I have to apologize again I, for the Chicago Cubs and the Chicago White Sox. I mean, it's, it's so stupid. And, you know, uh, and I should have remembered where we some are. Of, and it just, some, anyway. of us, some of us are not native Chicagoans and, I know, and don't I, have I this. I know, but I knew it, and I knew and it. Can, and love both teams. Yeah, you know? I, I understand. Um, <laughs> so let me ask you this. Um, <laughs> if there was, you, you've done these masterful works that have taken so much of your time if you had another, who, who haven't you done that you, if you could, you would? 
Well, I'm not sure that I will, but if I could, I would. It might be old George Washington. I am working on a documentary for the History Channel on George Washington. There'll be experts who know George Washington, filmmakers who know him, and I'm going to be a consultant because at least I want to learn about him that way. I really know almost nothing about him. It's amazing how you can have this figure that still seems remote despite wonderful books written about him if you haven't studied him. So I think it would be him, but mostly, if I only could be old enough, I'd love to write about the first female president, whoever she may be. That would be my absolute goal in life. <laughs> but that better happen soon. Thank you. Well, Doris, sitting, sitting with you, is, to me, is always like an American communion. Uh, and uh, nobody... Nobody understands, appreciates, reflects, and explains the soul of America better than you. And uh, it's, it's, a re it's always a pleasure and an honor uh, to be with you. You are a great American. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Thank you. Well, I'm glad to be here. Thank you all very much. Thank you.